The Stone of Destiny, also known as the Stone of Scone, is a large block of sandstone that traditionally served as the coronation seat of Scottish kings. According to legend, the stone was used as a pillow by the biblical figure Jason, before it made its way to Dalriada in western Scotland. It was here that the stone would remain until 840 AD, when Kenneth I, 36th king of Dalriada, moved the stone to the site of his new capital in Scone, not to be confused with the English pastry of the same name. The stone continued to serve as the Scottish coronation seat until 1296, when it was seized by King Edward I of England, following his victory at the Battle of Dunbar. The stone, along with other pieces of Scottish regalia, was then transported to London, where it was incorporated as part of the English coronation chair. Despite strenuous objections, the Stone of Destiny remained with the coronation chair in Westminster Abbey until one Christmas in 1950 when a group of students from Glasgow University decided to liberate it. On December 25, 1950, Ian Hamilton, Kay Matheson, Gavin Vernon, and Alan Stewart broke into Westminster Abbey and took the Stone of Destiny. While the stone was eventually returned to London, the orchestrator of the escapade, Ian Hamilton, decided to publish his account of events in a book creatively titled Stone of Destiny. Over half a century later, in 2008, his book was adapted into a feature film, directed by Charles Martin Smith and starring a very young Charlie Cox. But how does the film measure up to the book it was based on? The film actually does a fairly good job recreating Mr. Hamilton's version of events and how they're represented in the book. Thoroughly disheartened by his country's disinterest in home rule, 25-year-old law student Ian Hamilton decides to steal the Stone of Destiny, believing that doing so will serve to inspire his fellow countrymen. Realizing that he can't accomplish the deed on his own, he recruits his friend, Bill Craig, and what follows is a montage of research, ending in a trip to Westminster Abbey, where Ian asks some very pointed questions about the Abbey's security and cleaning protocols. In search of a financial backer, Ian decides to visit the head of the Covenant movement, John McCormick, who grants him the requested sum of £50, while remarking that he too was once part of a plan to bring back the Stone of Destiny, which never came to fruition. With everything set, Ian decides that the best time to break into the Abbey would be on Christmas Eve, though his friend Bill starts to get cold feet and backs out of the plan. Disheartened but not deterred, Ian recruits Kay Matheson and Gavin Vernon to his cause, and the three make preparations for the long trip to London. To Ian's dismay, however, Gavin decides to make a fourth addition to the team, in the form of 20-year-old engineering student Alan Stewart. Under the belief that adding a fourth person will only complicate matters, Ian rejects Alan's request to come along until Gavin mentions that he has access to a car, which forces Ian to recant his earlier decision. Arriving in London on the 23rd, the team, despite being chilled and sleep-deprived from the long journey, decide to jump the gun and try to steal the stone that night. Unfortunately, Ian's plan to conceal himself in the abbey and break down one of the doors using burglary tools hidden in his jacket goes awry when he's discovered by the night watchman. Luckily, Ian's able to convince the watchman that he was locked in by accident and is allowed to leave. Frustrated but free, Ian returns to the car to find Gavin, and the pair go to meet up with Alan and Kay to try to formulate a new plan. While the team is disheartened, Alan quotes the story of King Robert the Bruce, who, according to legend, was inspired by a persistent spider who tried and failed to spin its web six times, until eventually succeeding on the seventh attempt. Inspired by Alan's words of wisdom, the group decide to go back to the Abbey to see if they can glean any more information and formulate a new plan. Unfortunately, the next morning it's discovered that Kay isn't feeling well, and the team decide that, despite their limited funds, she could probably benefit from a few hours of sleep in a warm hotel. 
Ian checks Kay into a hotel under an alias, but promises to call her before making another attempt on the stone. After discovering some very useful information, the team decide to break into the abbey using the poet's corner door, which, unlike the surrounding doors, is made of much softer pine. With their newly formulated plan, the trio go to fetch Kay, but arouse the suspicions of the hotel owner, who calls the police. Under the assumption that the group are actually car thieves, the policeman asks Ian to provide proof of the car's ownership, and he reluctantly hands over the rental papers. Now convinced that the police have their license plate number, the group wastes no time returning to the abbey. After breaking into the mason's yard, a group of sheds housing tools and equipment used for repairing the abbey, they make their way to the poet's corner door and begin the very loud process of breaking down the door using Ian's crowbar. After making their way through the door and freeing the stone from the confines of the coronation chair, the trio attempt to lift the stone and end up breaking it. Oops. While they're initially a bit disturbed by this development, they decide that, if anything, this will at least make the stone a lot easier to transport. So, after taking the small section of the stone to Kay, the three continue their struggle with the larger piece until they get tired and decide to use Ian's coat as a makeshift sling to help them transport it down the stairs. Unfortunately, before they can make it down the stairs, they hear the car moving and Ian is forced to leave the stone to go and check on Kay, who informs him that she's just been seen by a police officer. Ian quickly climbs into the front seat, and he and Kay try to pull off the Don't mind us, we're just instant lovebirds cliche, explaining to the cop that they came to London to attend a Christmas party, but were too late to get a hotel room. This works, surprisingly, and the officer gives them directions to a nearby parking garage where he says they can spend the night. After arriving at the parking garage, incidentally the same parking garage where they park their other car, Kay and Ian decide that the best course of action is for her to take the smaller piece of the stone to a friend in the Midlands, who can hide her until the heat dies down, while Ian goes back to get the rest. This plan soon falls apart as Ian discovers that he is no longer in possession of his car keys, which he put in the pocket of his coat, the same coat that they were using to transport the stone. Oops. Ian rushes back to the abbey, but discovers that Al and Gavin are no longer there, and they seem to have taken his coat and the keys along with them. After rushing back to the parking garage, Ian discovers that the car is still undisturbed, and Gavin and Alan are nowhere in sight. Ian then comes to the realization that if the car is still there, it must mean that Al and Gavin don't have the keys, which probably fell out of his coat. Ian then rushes back to the abbey again, where, in his first stroke of luck in the past 20 minutes, he finds the keys and retrieves the stone. While driving away from the abbey, Ian runs into Alan and Gavin, who are overjoyed to discover that he has the stone. But because Ian is worried that any more weight will cause the car to fall apart, the team decide to split up and Alan and Gavin go their separate ways. Ian and Alan hide the stone in the English countryside, and then return to Scotland. However, despite their brilliantly executed caper, Ian lost his watch at Westminster Abbey. God, these people are so lucky DNA evidence didn't exist in 1950, and he decides to come clean to his parents about his involvement with the stone heist. To Ian's surprise, his parents are actually very proud of their son's act of blatant thievery, and even admit that they assumed his involvement from the very beginning. However, the good times don't last, as Ian is awoken the next morning by Alan and Gavin, who explain that Alan's father, a civil engineer, is worried about the negative effects of cold weather on the stone, believing that the combination of cold and moisture could cause the stone to freeze and break apart. Deciding that they need to take immediate action, Ian, Alan, and Bill Craig decide to drive back to retrieve the stone only to find out that their hiding spot is inhabited by gypsies. After an impassioned speech about the importance of freedom and resisting oppression, the gypsies are inspired to let them take the stone, and even help them carry it to their car. Yet God love gypsies, am I right? The film then ends with the team placing the stone upon the high altar in the Abbey of Arbroth, before getting arrested, though the end credits assure us that they were never charged. 
a fact which I plan to elaborate on in a later section. While the film is fairly historically accurate, it alters and emits a few important facts. While we're introduced to Ian's parents fairly early on in the film, in the book Ian mentions that prior to his Christmas visit, he hadn't been back home since summer. Ian's first visit to Westminster Abbey took place in 1949, not 1950 like it does in the film, though he was less thorough than on later occasions. John McCormick, the chairman of the Covenant Movement, was far more agreeable than his film counterpart. His initial misgivings about financing the Stone Heist weren't based on mistrust as much as concern, as he knew that all involved were risking jail time if they were caught. Ian alleviated his concerns by assuring him that he was well aware of the dangers, and that if he didn't receive the money from him, he'd simply find someone else to give him the required funds. He never became frustrated with Ian or forced him out of his house, and simply handed him the money as opposed to tossing it to him through an open window like in the film, though the latter is a lot more dramatic. McCormick's plan to recover the stone was also very different from the way it was described in the film. Rather than dressing like a group of monks, the actual plan required one person to cause a distraction, while the others grabbed the stone and rushed out of the abbey before being noticed. There are clearly quite a few things wrong with this plan, the least of them being that the stone's weight would make the act of running anywhere with it very difficult. In the film, Ian's friend Bill Craig decides to quit the heist after realizing that getting arrested would probably put a damper on his upcoming wedding. In the book, Ian never mentions that Bill had a girlfriend in 1950. Instead, Bill just had a very packed Christmas schedule a side effect of his position as president of the student union, and therefore suggested that they steal the stone another time. Afraid that he might lose his resolve if he was forced to wait, Ian decided to go ahead and steal a stone without him. In the film, during his first attempt on the stone, Ian is shown hiding behind a grave, but according to the book, he curled up at the bottom of a cleaner's cart and pulled his coat over his head. Ian initially planned to move from the cleaner's cart to St. Paul's Chapel, which was under construction at the time, but was discovered and ejected by the night watchman before it could get there. Ian also doesn't say anything about receiving money from the night watchman, though he did check to make sure he had enough money to afford a hotel room before ejecting him. The real-life Kay Matheson only confided in Ian about her illness, and was adamant that he didn't tell Alan and Gavin, believing that their concern for her might compromise the mission. This means that Alan and Gavin's fight about going home and the resulting vote where they all decide to stay is a film addition. If you're wondering why Alan and Gavin would agree to spend their limited funds on a hotel room for Kay if they didn't know she was sick, Ian never says. But I assume they either figured out she was sick or just felt bad that Kay had spent the better part of the last two days freezing to death. Because one thing that they don't really convey in the film is that neither of their cars had heaters. Alan and Gavin's search for information played out a bit differently than it does in the film. While walking around the cloisters, the pair were approached by an archdeacon, who was more than happy to explain everything he could about the architecture of the abbey. While they were talking, the night watchman, the same night watchman who ejected Ian the night before, came out of his office to talk to the Archdeacon, and remarked that he would soon be going off duty at 11pm. This new information, combined with Ian's earlier research on the Abbey, formed the backbone of their new plan. As the location of the Watchman's office in the northwest corner of the Cloisters made it unlikely that he would hear them forcing open the door at Poet's Corner. In addition to misplacing his watch and car keys, Ian also managed to misplace his coat during the raid on the Abbey. After failing to locate Ian at the parking garage, Alan and Gavin placed his coat behind the car and left to go look elsewhere. Why they decided to put it behind the car as opposed to on top of it, I have no idea, but after retrieving his car keys, Ian hurried back to the Abbey, leaving his coat behind in the garage. While you're right to assume that a random coat, abandoned at a parking garage, would likely have been overlooked by the police, the garage's close proximity to Westminster Abbey, as well as the fact that the coat had Ian's name on it, was understandably concerning. 
So, after hiding the stone, Ian and Alan were forced to double back to London so they could retrieve the incriminating coat. While reading this book, there were times when I would just stop and ask myself, how did these people not get caught? This was one of those times. Before they parted ways outside the abbey, Ian and Alan made plans to meet Gavin at Reading Station, where they intended to rent another car, which he and Alan could then use to move the stone to a new hiding place. Ian would then take Alan's car, which was spotted by the police outside of Kay's hotel, and drive to Wales to lay down a false trail. Ian eventually decided against this convoluted plan and went back to Reading Station to meet Alan. This turned out to be a very good decision, as Gavin never arrived at Reading Station. Ian eventually caught up with Gavin at the university and found out why he had failed to meet them at Reading. Apparently, while getting something to eat, Gavin discovered a man looking at him suspiciously. Fearing that he might be a policeman, Gavin left immediately after finishing his meal, but couldn't shake the feeling that he was being followed. So he skipped the rendezvous at Reading and took the train back to Scotland. The ceremony where Ian, Kay, Alan, Gavin, Bill, and John McCormick gathered together to pour out a libation of whiskey to Scotland and the Stone of Destiny was more of an impromptu ceremony in the book. According to Ian Hamilton, after they finished transporting the stone back over the border, he, Alan, and Bill ripped off the old coat they were using to hide the stone and poured out a libation of whiskey to honor the occasion. It's also worth mentioning that Ian and Kay never met again after they parted ways in London. After returning to Scotland, Kay took a teaching position at Duncraig Castle School in Wester Ross. I'd like to apologize to anyone who saw the movie and decided to ship Ian and Kay, but as this is a historical movie from 2009, I doubt anyone cares enough to complain. Then again, this is the internet. In the film, Alan gives an impassioned speech to the gypsies to convince them to give up the stone. In reality, this speech was delivered by Bill Craig. This alteration was probably made because it worked better with Alan's character. Because the film depicts Alan as quiet and meek, forcing him to give an inspiring speech in front of a group of strangers is a good way to end his character arc. However, while this change may have made sense from a cinematic standpoint, it's still a point against the film historically. The film leaves out a lot of details from the book, including Ian's self-introduction where he talks about his childhood and how he first learned about the Stone of Destiny. When Ian was a boy in the 1930s, England returned a collection of historical records back to Scotland. This caused quite a stir, especially among activists such as Wendy Wood, who took to the streets wearing a sandwich board which read, England scourges some of the loot, but where is the Stone of Destiny? A picture of Wendy Wood and her sandwich board was featured in the Bolton newspaper, which prompted little Ian Hamilton to ask his mother about the Stone of Destiny. In the film, it's implied that Wendy Wood and her sandwich board are the inspiration behind Ian's plan to steal the Stone of Destiny, though the film never explains the connection. A few people that feature fairly prominently in the book are cut out of the film entirely. One such person is Counselor Bertie Gray, a monumental sculptor who provided Ian with a wealth of important information about the Stone of Destiny. Counselor Grey was also responsible for repairing and hiding the stone after it was transported back to Scotland. Another important figure who had his contributions cut from the film was John Jocelyn, the fourth member of the team that helped transport the stone back to Scotland. Jocelyn actually played a very important role in the plan to smuggle the stone back over the border. While transporting the stone back to Scotland, Ian was adamant that they shouldn't hide it in the trunk of the car, as he believed this was too obvious of a hiding spot. Keep in mind that after the stone was stolen, the police set up roadblocks at the border, so Ian's claim wasn't quite as paranoid as it sounded. They instead decided to remove the bottom section of the front seats, a special feature of this car apparently, which they swapped out for the stone. This solved one problem, but created another, as they now had a random loose car seat that was bound to provoke some questions if it was discovered by the police. 
Thus, it was decided that John would get out before they reached the border and take the seat back with him to Scotland on the train. Unfortunately, as seems to be the trend with this group, they ended up dropping John off in front of a police box. The constable that came to greet him found it quite strange that he was transporting a car seat the day before New Year's Eve. Though John claimed to be doing a favor for a friend whose car seat was ruined by a pig. And thus ends the tale of John Jocelyn and the car seat. In the aftermath of the stone heist, Ian, Bill, John McCormick, and Bertie Gray wrote a letter to King George VI, where they stated their reasons for stealing the stone, as well as certain conditions which they hoped would be upheld. They explained that they never intended to damage royal property or disrespect the church, and were even willing to give up the stone if the king agreed that it would remain in Scotland. After failing to obtain an appropriate response from the English government, they decided to restate their aims in another petition, which also fell on deaf ears. This, combined with growing public concern for the stone, forced them to relinquish it to the English authorities. However, after the stone was recovered at the Abbey of Arbroath, it was quickly spirited back over the border and the conditions of the letter were completely ignored. This aroused a lot of anger from the Scottish people and may have been one of the reasons why Ian, Allen, Gavin, and Kay were never convicted. While the English government was initially opposed to the idea of allowing the Stone of Destiny to remain in Scotland, the stone was eventually returned on loan in 1996 and now resides in Edinburgh Castle. For those that are wondering, the term on loan in this case refers to the fact that the stone is free to remain in Scotland but will be taken back to London in the event of a royal coronation. When the Stone of Destiny was spirited away from Westminster Abbey that early December morning, it was a symbol, one that Ian Hamilton hoped would inspire Scotland to embrace its past and look to a future free of British rule. Now, 70 years later, that future may be on the horizon, as polls now show that 54% of Scottish voters support independence. Well, I'm Silver Jade, and as always, I must ask you to please remember to support your local library, and I'll see you next time.